Village in San Paulo, and it appears that traffic jams are so bad that all of the executives arrive by a helicopter. How does that impact the residents next to the landing pads? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, that's exactly what we are trying to uh, tell on our presentation. The impact of uh, this, this, the situation that we have in a big city like Sao Paulo, uh, when we have, uh, like Shanghai, 20 million people living uh, in the very uh, short space, create these, uh, uh, these uh, challenges. And I believe that uh, the, the right now, uh, with the new uh, master plan that was issued uh, by our uh, major a uh, few weeks ago, uh, what uh, they are encouraging is th to build uh, new uh, real estate properties, uh, like buildings, like tall buildings, just uh, close to uh, public transportation. Because, uh, for example, I, I take sometimes one hour to to get to my job, uh, and usually in, during weekends is a ten minute uh, way. So. This creates a, a huge uh, problem, and uh, we have to deal uh, investing more in public transportation and in infrastructure. And that's why now the the rules and uh, are so restrict uh, in in São Paulo, and most of the big uh, developments uh, of tall buildings are are being built outside of uh, ma the major cities. So right now, the the uh, we we see uh, tall buildings being built uh, in the south of Brazil, Camboriú, which is a, a, a touristic place, and, and, we, uh, and there, uh, this is the kind of uh, movement that is happening right now in Brazil. My question is directed, directed to Michael Bischoff, and that is about your very impressive discussion of the building in New York. And I wonder if you could elaborate on the tension between doing good in terms of sustainable vertical urbanism and the commerciality of the project? Were there benefits for the developer in terms of height and density associated with the environmental issues that you talked about? It'd be very interesting to know about that relationship. Well, that's always a, a bit of a struggle and it's a very good question. I think the, I mean, one of the, the notions here of this building was first of the, the idea that within the city of New York is a steel frame that provides kind of a, a speed of erection, which um, given kind of the cost of capital that we've heard before, and this not being a super tall building, but still being tall enough that speed of erection was an important thing to, I think, is something to consider. And also even the idea of normally for residential buildings, basically the unitized curtain wall market is not necessarily um, it's something that's more associated with, with office buildings, with a certain premium. But what we're finding, actually, is the unitized wall market has become very competitive, and actually the prices have dropped such, or in a way that um, with, you know, the speed of erection and kind of um, man curtain wall manufacturing companies getting closer to having more different places that they're fabricating, making shipping easier, and things like that, that actually, I think it can be argued that kind of the higher quality of the envelope that you're getting which can actually improve kind of long-term maintenance issues for buildings, which would provide kind of a well-insulated envelope that would actually also lead to, lead to a kind of occupancy comfort and satisfaction. But those are things that would make this, these buildings, while they seem um, fancy, they may also become in the long term um, more kind of affordable from a market point of view in terms of kind of long-term cost benefit. Now, low buildings versus high-rise high buildings, I mean, that's always kind of high-rise buildings. We know are, are more expensive kind of as a premise to construct generally. But within urban areas like Lower Manhattan, if you think back to that first image, the density and the desirability of those, of those residential areas, there aren't that many spots. And when, when I seized upon that site, I, realized it was, I, I asked myself for so many years why this site hasn't been built because it really seemed like there was like one spot that was like begging for, for a residential, for a tower right between the historic um, uh, fish market district, uh, Fulton Street District, and kind of a residential area that or, or had already been built around it. 
And the only thing that had really been, there's actually legal things having to do with that site and the ownership and certain kind of uh, legal issues that have been posed that have prevented the developer from building on that site. And as a result, it's been sitting there empty for a long time as a parking lot. But um, I think when eventually a tall building is the right thing for that site, even though I know that the local community still is a little bit uncertain about tall buildings, more tall buildings in lower Manhattan. I don't know if that gets to your question exactly, but um, it's um, more and more, you know, the, this con as this conference is posing, that uh, tall buildings are becoming more com commercially viable, both for, com for office as well as residential space. My question is to Arthur and to Victor. Probably more to Arthur because uh, the United States being a litigious society, uh, my question is the supply of uh, water and electricity to a building involves a duty of care. Uh, what is your approach to the supply of indoor air quality, the air that people breathe in a building with regard to legal liability? Yeah, uh, thank you for your question. I uh, tried to tried to address that a little bit in the talk, that your uh, rights to not have your property interfered with um, are protected under U.S. law and, and laws around the world, and whether something constitutes an unreasonable interference, such as um, uh, ruining the indoor air quality of your building, um, you'd look at, look at other, you, you would make that claim, and you would take, take the person to court that said, and say, you've ruined my indoor air quality with this new building, um, or whatever use you were putting that land to. And uh, depending on <coughs> all the different legal precedents that would be involved, you, you would either win or, or lose, and, and it would depend very much on the exact circumstances, um, which is what the law is meant to do, is, is provide a fair outcome that's predictable to those who think they have been wronged, and including uh, an example of ruining somebody's indoor air quality. I wonder if I can just take an extension of that question to Matt and just ask what your experience, Matt, is of trying to use natural ventilation, obvious, with its obvious sustainability benefits, but what has been the experience of, of buildings that have tried to adapt that as much as they possibly can? Sure, thanks. And um, you can hear me okay with this? Uh, what, what we've seen, I guess, with natural ventilation in markets where air quality is better than it is in others is that it's a good way to reduce energy costs, energy consumption, that kind of thing. But that argument flips on its head when the outdoor air quality isn't great. So, you know, in markets in Asia, in, in China, it, it, air quality is a huge issue. So, um, yes, there are building standards that govern this kind of thing around the, kind, the, 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 the quality of air coming in and what sort of filtration needs to be put into a building. But if you compare that against something like the, the LEED standards, the US EPA standards, they're quite different. So you can comply with local uh, requirements around indoor air quality, but not comply with a LEED requirement. So in some ways, actually having a LEED certified building or a building which actively pursues the kinds of uh, you know, measures and, and, and methods that, that are used in a, in a LEED or a, or a green design building, you're actually creating a marketing edge. You know, in the past, a lot of my work has been focused on energy efficiency in existing buildings. And the reason is because energy pays. You know, if you reduce your energy consumption, there's a good financial return from that. And you know, we all know that saving water doesn't necessarily save you money. It can be a lot of cost to save water. What we're actually seeing now is that a lot of our clients and our tenants that are coming into buildings, they're asking a lot of, of, of more pointed questions about what's the air quality like in this building? How often do you monitor that? How do you maintain that at a, at a, at a high standard? If you're a Google or you're, you're a company like that, that that values your workplace experience so highly, you're going to be investing in that very heavily. Similarly, if you're a you know a school or a, or a you know aged care facility, something like that, where it's not just a nice to have, there's actually a broader health benefit to it as well. You can actually find that these buildings that have that that higher standards uh, are, are attracting a market premium. <coughs> All right. Thank you very much. My question is in Chinese. My question is addressed to Michael. My question goes to Michael. So my question is, uh, you actually introduced 8x8 eight eight tower uh, using a lot of a vertical uh, green space. Yes, it created a wonderful atmosphere for a green community. So my question is, uh, you use uh, like the 8th floor vertical uh, green wall. So in the operational phase, 
how can you maintain the effectiveness of your design? Uh, what about the operational cost? How high the cost is? Is it the tenants that pay the cost? Thank you. Who pays for the cost? I'll, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not an expert in that point of view in terms of who pays the cost and how a, a developer might have a different strategy depending on how a building is marketed. But I would say it's um, that the, the gardens are broken into eight, foot, eight floor sections. And in terms of one thing that's very important about establishing the eight floor sections was that I felt that it would create there's a certain number of residents that were also associated with those same eight floors that would converge around the community spaces. So both for a social reason as well as a technical reason of trying to maintain kind of certain units that were of a certain size. It felt like it was important to establish a, a size that was manageable from a, both a technical as well as a social um, um, scale point of view or s just functionally a size point of view. And I'm curious whether um, others who are building managers might kind of share that in terms of like a vertical garden, how tall a vertical garden can go and still be maintained properly as a garden. Then with respect though to the costs associated with that, I think you have to build kind of overall good technologies such as you know rainwater technologies or other kind of maintenance technologies that would allow you to maintain such a thing in a um, just in a healthy but also reasonable um, manner within any building. You always have things that you need to maintain. This is one type of a facade that um, if designed properly probably shouldn't require, I would hope, maintenance that is so unruly um, if you've properly kind of designed the infrastructure at the beginning. And whether you see this as kind of a fundamental infrastructure or what was, so Matthew that you talk about the different, uh, the bells and whistles versus the base core things, I'm forgetting the terminology you used. But um, trying to see the idea of green walls and green spaces becoming I would try to argue that those need to be seen not as kind of extras that you just add on, but things that are fundamental to creating vertical urbanism that really will be kind of future thinking and sustainable, so that you'd need to build it into your costs somehow. If that means it, means, if that means it needs to be distributed among all the residents that share it in some way, then I think that's what would have to be the case. There's an example that I'm familiar with. This is not one of my projects. It's just something that I've come across. So in Hong Kong, uh, the MTR Corporation, so the Subway Corporation. One of, their, one of their sites has a big concrete roof and they were basically having um, damage problems from, from heat, from rain, that kind of thing. The concrete was, was cracking. And they, they started looking at green roofs as a way to, to minimise that impact on the building and to actually cut down on their maintenance cost on the, the, the concrete side of things. So they actually installed something like this on a, on a horizontal scale instead of a vertical scale. And what they've looked at, they've, they're looking quite far into the future. They're saying, well, water scarcity is a real problem. You know? and, and in Hong Kong, it gets a lot of its water from, imported from China. So it's being pumped in or, or, or you know, sent into Hong Kong. So they're saying, well, it doesn't make sense for us to put a green roof on there that's going to have high maintenance costs. So we need to select something, as you, as you mentioned, around rain, rainwater capture, that sort of thing, but also the plants that they select. So selecting the kinds of plants that can live in the right environment that don't need a lot of watering, that don't need a lot of maintenance, and that you don't reduce maintenance costs down to zero because it's something new that you've got, but you're changing. So you, you, you're getting away from this issue with the concrete structure that you had, and now you've, you've uh, installed this, this setup in quite a clever way that re reduces your maintenance costs, your watering costs, that kind of thing. So if you think that through, then, then it doesn't necessarily add a huge impact. Um, and it's, it, again, it comes back to my point, it's, it's about matching that technology or that feature to how the building is going to be used. Jason Haas, do you do you see a place for uh, the, uh, the the vertical or the horizontal garden with the high tech whiz kids of Seattle? Um, we're starting to see a lot of, of green outdoor space higher up in buildings, um, whether it's on the top of the podium or further up the tower. Uh, but typically, these are single occupant towers, so they take over the entire maintenance of the group of the entire building. But whenever it's a it's t typically an upfront cost that is part of the, the new construction. And then if done correctly, if <coughs> planted correctly, the long-term maintenance is significantly less than one might think with drought resistant or drought tolerant plants and things of that nature that it keeps them fairly low minimums, minimum uh, costs. Arthur. I appreciate the question about the cost because that is something we addressed in the legal discussion as well that the cost of shared expenses has to be planned for ahead of time. If you went to buy a unit in the building and you asked them, 
who takes care of the hanging gardens? And the answer was, I don't know. You wouldn't want to buy the building. You, it would be, it has to be covered uh, in the plans and in the arrangements that are made for the ownership of the property. So whatever the answer is, as long as you know ahead of time and it's accounted for, you can be comfortable buying in. What's not, you, would, you would not be comfortable if they said, we don't know who takes care of that. So it's the same as with a pool or an exercise room that you might find in a building. It has to be maintained um, and it has to be planned ahead of time who is going to be maintaining it and what are, if I buy one unit, how much of that do I have to pay, it, pay for? Um, my question is to Cassie Young. Um, your building is certified for lease highest level after it was built. What are those challenges you faced to get its certification? And what's your recommendations for others who try to get their existing building to be certified? And finally, what are those financial benefits for lead certification for existing buildings? Thanks. And can you answer that question in less than five minutes? <laughs> uh, it's a big question. Uh, I answer the last one first. Uh, financial benefits, I think mainly um, in energy saving, as uh, Matt mentioned, is energy cost saving that, w that you can see money. But the others are important uh, benefits also, like a better air quality. Uh, we have increased the frustration, uh, frustration rate of our in uh, incoming uh, fresh air from 65% to 85%. So we are saying uh, the a green building is not just an energy efficient building, it's actually a healthy building for people to, to stay inside the building. Um, and you were also asking uh, what are the challenges? Um, because the building was fairly new when we started our uh, lead application in 2009. Um, and of course we tried to uh, make it as uh, economical as possible to be able to, uh, in the beginning we were targeting at goal level and then a uh, consultant, uh, one year later consultant say maybe uh, if we do a few more projects then we could go for platinum. So we, we did and I think the challenge was um, to, to still try to, uh, uh, try to achieve all the uh, uh, the requirement of the points uh, with a building of 9,000 9, people already in the building. Uh, we have to submit all the uh, drawing plans of tenants uh, fill out uh, space and also we have to go into tenant space to uh, several times to take ma all kinds of measurements. So that takes a lot of uh, coordination and backing and asking people to, to stay uh, after work for us to go into their space to, to do this work. Uh, so I think the biggest challenge maybe because uh, we already have so many uh, tenants. It's not a single owner, uh, single occupier building. It's a building of 90 something uh, com uh, companies and uh, 9,000 people at that time. So, so I, I think probably that's the biggest challenge. And what was the sec second question? Oh, what for other uh, owners? Um, I think every building should uh, to try to be more green. Uh, and our building, uh, the big challenge, of course, is because we, we have such a big space. We, we are like 20, uh, uh, 2 million square meter of uh, office space. Uh, no, sorry, 2 million square feet of office space. So it's, it's a big building, so uh, it took us exactly like two years to complete all the, uh, all the requirements. But for a smaller building, for any type of building, uh, it, it would be much easier work for you. Uh, and uh, if you are old building, uh, you still, you, you actually absolutely need to do it because if you change your chiller, then your return, you can see your return maybe in just a few uh, years. Uh, so I think really it's worthwhile for every building owner to consider. And um, this question is actually triggered by what Jason has shared about the uh, vertical campus. But I think this question is kind of open to the rest of the panels, if you can share some of your views as well. Because increasingly we are looking at, maybe in the Chinese context, uh, we have verticalization of this super high rise. And it's a mixed use verticalization. It's not just purely on a certain mix of tenants. And what you shared here, Jason, is about a particular set of tenants, the uh, tech tenants, which has very, um, uh, very fixed um, requirements. But in China, they have been building a lot of uh, vertical high-rise, and there's mixed-use vertical high-rise combined with hotels, combined with residentials, combined with offices. And sometimes the offices, um, the client doesn't really know what kind of tenant is going to be inside. You know, they might say, oh, you know, we, we might want to bring in fire tenants or 
we might want to bring in um, world-class tenants, but you don't know what kind of tenant is going to be inside. So this opens up um, a lot of questions in terms of you know, maintenance, in terms of management, in terms of legal issues as well. How are you going to deal with that? One of the things that we're seeing, we do quite a few speculative office buildings in our, in our market in Seattle. We know about 50% of the market out there looking for space current in the last few years has been tech tenants, but the other half has been the fire tenants, and you really never know. Um, but we're really what we've been doing is going with the most strict and stringent uh, guidelines, the, the requirements that uh, any tenant is going to re require, but the, the extreme tenant would, would need to check off on their list of things. Um, things like um, uh, live loads, like I mentioned in our, the presentation, Typically, most tenants don't require the, the heavier um, structural need requirements. But if you don't build toward it, to it, you may have eliminated 20, 30, 40% of your market if they're looking for, it, for a space in your, in, your, in your building. And we're finding that even buildings today and built in Seattle aren't accommodating technology tenants, even though it's 50% of the market. So my suggestion is maximize flexibility. It does have an upfront cost to it, but the cost of not doing it could be you lose half the market. Arguably, the communities that would most benefit from increased open green amenity spaces are those more socially disadvantaged communities. Um, but as was mentioned in one of the other presentations, the historical precedent for creating community spaces in disadvantaged communities in, in high-rise design has not gone well in the past. Um, do we understand enough and are we putting enough effort into understanding the operational challenges, the legal challenges, and hence then the design challenges that would allow us to bring those sorts of benefits to what looks like a great building to the vast majority of people, particularly those of, of low social standing? Hmm. I, I will give a short answer. I think that's, that, that's what the conference, that's what this group is here for, right? I mean, to try to solve these problems that we've seen in the past that, that are really we don't know the answer yet to every single issue that's been seen with the high-rise building, but this, that's what the great aspect of this group, this interdisciplinary group and these conferences is for. I, I know that's not really an answer, but I, uh, I wanted to say I appreciate being here and being part of the efforts to solve the problems you, you point out. Well, your, your question, though, just makes me want to state something at least is, would be a concern of mine or something, a goal of mine, and, I, and indeed we're speaking to goals here too, aspirations, which is indeed that, because in New York City now in particular, and also in Shanghai certainly, because the cities are alike in many ways as we know, regarding affluence and all that kind of stuff and the kind of the broad spectrums of affluence versus the less affluent, that um, there's this, you know, these high tall residential buildings are being occupied largely by very wealthy. But the, the goal in thinking about this was indeed and understanding there's some contradiction there because in principle one might say this only can be afforded by the wealthy because the cost point would be high. But indeed it was thinking about living environments that would really cross the spectrum in terms of something that would really be, wasn't something that's des not designed as, as an environment that is really one that would be sought out by only the super wealthy because the super wealthy are looking for these high-rise buildings as something to get away from community or get away from other people. But these, the building in this design was really trying to say, okay, can you place in a high-rise environment those things that we attribute to the more less perfect environment, which is the ground plane, where you have things mixed up and a little more messy, and communities, you are interacting with a broader spectrum of social um, variation within our community. And now whether that's really has become a reality in terms of the cost point, that's hard to say, but I think ultimately, given the notion of this conference, the goal is to try to figure out how to build more effectively, economically, um, for the long term, so that as so that you can actually say to make urbanism and vertical ur urbanism sustainable, I think it actually has to be something that's accessible to a broader spectrum of the community. I, I think there's an angle to this from a top-down and a bottom-up approach. So we're talking a lot about new buildings big companies, high rises, all that kind of stuff. That's the top end of town, right? You know, this is, this is like the Ferraris and the, the iPhone 6. It's the, the newest, latest technology. And to some extent, there's going to be a trickle down of that technology over time. So that, that's great. So we, we need to keep pushing the boundaries on at the, at the upper end of the market there because there's going to be a longer term benefit coming to the other parts of the market. 
But we also need to look at, you know, what about building standards and, and that kind of thing? What role does the government play in raising the standards from the, from the ground up? So we know that the top end of the market knows how to build green. We know that that's, that's happening already. So you make a very good point. You know, what about existing buildings? What about <coughs> lower grade buildings? What about the, you know, people who can't, can't afford this kind of thing? So, you know, it doesn't mean that the government has to go and mandate every building out there has to become LEED certified. That's going to be probably pretty expensive. But they can mandate things around energy efficiency that, you know, that do pay or around water efficiency, which have a long-term benefit. So, so it kind of needs to be top down and bottom up, I think. Just a, a small contribution here. Uh, what I see in, in my profession, I'm um, a real estate attorney in Brazil, is that uh, sometimes the, the building was designed for some type of people, but who occupy, really occupy, has another uh, thinking and doesn't want to use the, the property in the way it was designed. So uh, we are allowed in Brazil to change the, sometimes what uh, the, 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 the the real, the, the existing design, in order to uh, accommodate what the really the, the actual occupant wants for for this property. So this is also possible for, for in our country to do it. Uh, hi, Ross Timpson from Horizon Scan. Um, recently uh, studied the new international standard on BIMS, uh, Building Information Management Systems, uh, and I can foresee a revolution uh, for the use of BIMS, especially for condition monitoring inside buildings assist with the efficiency of the buildings. Just as very quickly as the panel, what do they see uh, some of the innovations that may come out of advanced BIM systems linked with smartphones, occupant monitoring, that kind of thing? Uh, look, I, I think I'm seeing the same trend. You know, I, I think that it, it's starting to happen. Um, it has been a bit restricted to major developments in the past. Um, and, and I think that there's going to be a whole lot of benefits in terms of predictive maintenance and all of, all of that sort of thing, you know, in terms of how that, how that plays out in an existing building. Having said that, I also think it does create a burden on an operations team in that that information is only valuable when it's up to date. You know, if you think back to what, what came before BIMS, so we had site drawings, asset registers, all that kind of stuff. Very, very often you go into a site and you realise that that information is way out of date. So if we're investing in something like BIMS, which, which does come at a cost with a benefit, it's even more critical that we keep that up to date or else you lose any of those, those, those abilities to, you know, get better at other aspects of it. And it's not just... BIMs and it's the sheer volume of information we're talking about that will become accessible as a result of, of, of a BIM system, not unlike the, the problem you face with um, rarity of skills that can manage and analyse properties. You know, you're going to need a very specialist skill, I think, to, to use a BIM system to properly, you know, to utilise its information and maximise that building to its fullest. Um, but they are absolutely um, the trend of how properties are going. All of that information in construction is being transferred to the management and operation of the property. Um, we have to become much more experienced as a, as a discipline in dealing with, uh, with, with using the, the, the sheer volume of information that's going to be on hand to us. And it's a it is one of the big challenges for the future. Very, very quickly, if you have a chance to hear a talk about the new Shanghai Tower next door, I think that is close to, if not on, the cutting edge of collecting data about operations of, of a building and monitoring, keeping it up to date, as was said over here, and um, using it to improve the, the performance of the building, the, the comfort of the occupants, and the sustainability, the energy consumption of the building, too. Uh, because uh, uh, from the property manager perspective, sustainability also means uh, we have sufficient resources to run the building. And, but in China, we know that uh, in most of the cases, it's very difficult to increase the management fee uh, after the, it is fixed in the first year. So uh, can you share uh, what will be your, your experience in the past 10 years? Uh, what, what have you done in, the, in Taipei 101? How do you tackle this? You mean for improvement projects? Uh, I mean that how to um, keep the building with a sufficient uh, management fee. Uh, in the first few years, we have to, of course, we have to take our money from the, our pocket, rental income pocket, to, to subsidize uh, the operation needs. Of course, it's the same company. Uh, but uh, after we reach about 85% occupancy, I think our, our management fee collection can cover the uh, operation needs. Uh, of course, water, electricity is shared by all of the tenants, except for the exterior lighting. They, they insist that the owner needs to pay for the exterior lighting electricity. So otherwise, uh, I think after reaching a certain percentage of occupancy, you'll be able to cover. 
uh, maybe a higher percentage because of the cost is much higher. Um, and, um, and, and there's a limit of how much management fee you can charge, of course, in every market. We're already charging uh, a higher uh, management fee than other buildings. Mm -hmm.